The reports about the Q star model breakthrough, what's going on there? No particular comment on that unfortunate leak. Sam Altman confirmed Q star. Ilya Sutskever may be out of OpenAI. Elon Musk says OpenAI is lying about using copyrighted data. And synthetic data is having its moment. And how are all of these stories related? I'm going to break it all down. Let's go. So first, OpenAI released a blog post. Sam Altman returns as CEO. OpenAI has a new initial board. So after all the dust has settled, it is true. Sam Altman is back as CEO. And as Omar from The Wire says, Hey, yo, lesson here, babe. You come at the king, you best not miss. And it looks like a lot of people did miss. So let's take a look at this blog post. Mira Marathi as CTO. So her old role, same role. Greg Brockman returns as president. And Brett Taylor is now the board chair. So this is a blog post from Sam to the company. I'm returning to OpenAI as CEO. Mira will return to her role as CTO. And the new initial board will consist of Brett Taylor, Larry Summers, and Adam D'Angelo. He goes on to talk about him being really excited and very grateful for everyone's hard work. Now this next paragraph is extremely telling. I love and respect Ilya. Now, if you don't remember, Ilya was a big reason that Sam Altman got fired in the first place. We still don't know the exact reason, but we have a lot of ideas and QSTAR is one of them. What a lot of people think happened and what I think happened is OpenAI made a big discovery and a big leap towards AGI and Sam Altman wanted to commercialize it immediately. Ilya and the rest of the board didn't. They wanted to slow down and they felt like they just could not control Sam Altman. So I love and respect Ilya. I think he's a guiding light of the field and a a gem of a human being. I harbor zero ill will towards him. While Ilya will no longer serve on the board, we hope to continue our working relationship and are discussing how he can continue his work at OpenAI. Now, it doesn't take a genius to read between the lines of this paragraph. I appreciate Sam Altman taking the high road and really trying to mend the relationship between him and Ilya, but something happened and we still don't know. And there's obviously still that disagreement there. And Ilya is no longer on the board. And why Ilya Sutsk cover leaving OpenAI might be so important is because Elon Musk and Ilya actually have an existing relationship that goes back a while. Elon Musk has had nothing but great things to say about Ilya, including that he has an extremely strong moral compass. So Elon Musk is trying to figure out what's going on at OpenAI that led Ilya to try a coup and try to get Sam Altman out. And I bet Elon Musk is aggressively trying to hire Ilya right now for X.AI. And this would be the perfect time to do so. And then he goes on to say, I'm grateful to Adam, Tasha, and Helen. I'm excited to continue to work with Adam and am sincerely thankful to Helen and Tasha for investing a huge amount of effort in this process. And again, it's very interesting that Adam got to stay because he is building a competing product with Poe. And he thanks Emmett, who came in as CEO for all of about seven and a half minutes. And then I think this next paragraph is really interesting. Greg and I are partners in running this company. He could not make that more clear. Sam sees them as equals. And the thing is, Sam Altman was always the real face of the company. He's the CEO. He was the one giving a bunch of talks, but Greg Brockman was the one in the trenches, making sure that they were at the frontier of artificial intelligence. We have never quite figured out how to communicate that on the org chart, but we will. In the meantime, I just wanted to make it clear. Thank you for everything you have done since the very beginning and for how you have handled things from the moment this started and over the last week. Now, the leadership team, Mira, Brad, Jason, Che, Hannah, Diane, Anna, Bob, Srinivas, Matt, Lillian, Miles, Jan, Wajek, John, Jonathan, Pat, and many more. The clear name missing from this list is Ilya, and I feel like he's just on his way out. Here he says, I'm sure books are going to be written about this time period, and I hope the first thing they say is how amazing the entire team has been. Now that we're through all of this, we didn't lose a single employee. That is absolutely insane to think about. Through all of this turbulence, through all of the offers that probably every single employee there got during this time from other companies that wanted to poach their employees, nobody left. That really says a lot about Sam and his leadership. Then at the end of this, he says, we have three immediate priorities. One, advancing our research plan and further investing in our full stack safety efforts, which have always been critical to our work. So again, if I'm reading between the lines, I'm thinking this is 
probably what spurred this entire episode for the last week and a half. I'm still convinced that Ilya and the board saw something that they were scared of, and that's why they fired Sam Altman. But he wants to reaffirm that safety is number one. Next, he's going to continue to improve and deploy our products and serve our customers. And last, Brett, Larry, and Adam will be working very hard on the extremely important task of building out a board of diverse perspectives. And that's important. The governance and the board are going to change. So for years now, OpenAI has been a nonprofit that owns this capped profit company. And a lot of people who looked at this structure thought it was absurd, and it turns out it didn't really work that well. So they're probably gonna be changing the board and the governance soon. So now let's move on to the Verges article, which is an interview with Sam Altman about being fired. But in this article, he talks a lot about other things, including essentially admitting Q Star was leaked. So after being fired, when the board called him back to rehire him like a day later, he basically said, it took me a few minutes to snap out of it and get over the ego and emotions to then be like, yeah, of course I want to do that. And then he said, obviously, I really loved the company and had poured my life force into this for the last four and a half years full time, but really longer than that with most of my time. And we're making such great progress on the mission that I care about so much, the mission of safe and beneficial AGI. And during the interview, Altman repeatedly declined to answer the main question on everyone's minds, exactly why he was fired to begin with. OpenAI's new board, led by Brett Taylor, is going to conduct an independent investigation into what went down. I very much welcome that, Altman told me. So hopefully we're going to find out sooner than later, because I am extremely curious. But again, I think it's something to do with QSTAR. So reading over the first few questions, the interviewer basically asked and re-asked Sam Altman, okay, why were you fired? Why were you fired? Why were you fired? And Sam Altman continues to decline to comment. And he basically says, the board will tell you, the investigation will tell you, ask them. And so he does confirm the board asked him to come back. Immediately after firing him, he got a ton of blowback. And then they realized, oh man, we messed up. All right, now the interesting part. The reports about the Q-Star model breakthrough that you all recently made, what's going on there? And this is Sam Altman. No particular comment on that unfortunate leak. So he basically says, I'm not commenting, but yeah, it was a leak. But what we have been saying two weeks ago, what we are saying today, what we've been saying a year ago, what we were saying earlier on is that we expect progress in this technology to continue to be rapid and also that we expect to continue to work very hard to figure out how to make it safe and beneficial. This is the most PR answer I've ever heard, but he does confirm that it leaked. Without commenting on any specific thing or project or whatever, we believe that progress is real research. You will always hit a wall, but we expect that progress will continue to be significant. So there it is. He's basically saying, yeah, Q star leaked, but I'm not going to say anything about it. Okay, next, and this may seem like a tangent, but it's going to be related and I'll bring it back around. You'll see. Elon Musk did a crazy interview with Andrew Ross Sorkin. And besides saying, go F yourself to X advertisers, which is a whole nother topic I'm not gonna get into. He did basically say that OpenAI is lying, that they're not training their models on copyrighted data. Let's take a look. One of the things about training on data has been this idea that you're not gonna train or, or that these things are not being trained on people's copyrighted information. Historically, that's been the concept. Yeah, that's a huge lie. Say that again? Yes, these AI, or these AIs are all trained on copyrighted data, obviously. So you think it's a lie when when OpenAI says that this is not n none of these guys say they're training on yeah. copyrighted da data. Oh, that's, that's a lie. It's a lie. Yeah, straight up. It's a straight up lie. Okay. Hundred percent. So then, obviously, it's been trained on copyrighted data. Okay, so let me ask you a second question, <laughs> which is all of the people who have been uploading. Okay, so immediately his laugh is amazing, but he said, yeah, it's a lie. They are training on copyrighted data. Of course they are. And this is going to be related to why synthetic data and why QSTAR all might be related. All of the people who have been uploading articles, best quotes from different articles, uh, videos, 2X, all of that can be trained on. And it's interesting because people put all of that there and those quotes have historically been considered fair use, right? They, yeah. People are putting those quotes up there and individually on a fair use basis, you'd say, okay, that makes sense. But now there are people who do threads. And by the way, there may be multiple people who've done, you know, an article that has a thousand words. Technically all thousand words could have made it onto X somehow. And effectively now you have this remarkable repository. And I wonder what you, how you think Okay, and let me pause it for a second. Now, with synthetic data aside, Elon Musk, either knowingly or unknowingly, did purchase one of the best data sets 
in history with X. He's getting so much data, so much unique data. And one of his first strategic moves after acquiring X was to shut down the API because he knew, he realized how valuable that data set was. And he didn't want third party developers using it. And I already made a video about this, how basically this is changing the face of the internet as we know it. What was previously a very open internet where third party developers could build incredible applications and value on top of data sets like this and Facebook and Google, now they're starting to get shut down. And how you think the creative community and those who were the original IP owners should think about that? I don't know, except to say that the, by the time these lawsuits are decided, we'll have digital God. So we have to ask digital God at that point. These lawsuits won't be decided before on a time frame that is relevant. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think we, we, we live, you know, there's that, I don't know if it's actually a real Chinese saying or not, but may, may you live in interesting times, right. which is apparently not a good thing. I, mean, I, I would prefer to, personally, I would prefer to live in interesting times. Um, and, and we live in the most interesting of times. For a while there, I was like really getting demotivated and losing sleep over the threat of AI danger. And then I finally sort of became fatalistic about it and said, well, even if I knew it was, annihilation was certain, uh, would I choose to be alive at that time or not? And I said, I probably would have choose to be alive at that time because it's the most interesting thing, even if there's nothing I could do about it. So then, you know, then basically a, sort of a fatalistic resignation helped me sleep at night because I was having trouble sleeping at night because of AI danger. Okay. Let's pause it right there. So basically what he's saying is it doesn't really matter whether companies like OpenAI are training on copyrighted data or not. By the time these things go through the court systems, it's going to be too late. And right here, he says that AI will be smarter than the smartest human in less than three years. So of course it doesn't really matter. OpenAI got this huge leap forward by training on copyrighted data. Now they're really gonna push the boundaries of that using synthetic data. And so by the time they get sued and it goes through the court systems, it's gonna be too late. AGI is gonna be here and it doesn't really matter anymore. Now, what to do about it? I mean, I've been the biggest, the, the one banging the drum the hardest, by far the longest, for AI danger and, and these regulatory things that are happening, the single biggest reason they're happening is because of me. Okay, so now what? Nathan Lambert, who I mentioned in my previous QSTAR video, has this incredible paper that he published yesterday about synthetic data, and he really breaks down everything about synthetic data. And synthetic data is truly the future of artificial intelligence. And I'm gonna pull out the most important points of his paper. So definitely check this out. I'll link it in the description below. So first, what is synthetic data? So it's data created by a machine rather than a human. And why is this important? So as I mentioned in the previous video, all the text from every single book ever created by humans could fit on a single hard drive. That's not a lot of data, especially when you're talking about creating AGI, which needs a tremendous amount of data. So how do you actually give it that much data? Because humans aren't creating it that fast. That's where synthetic data comes in. If machines are able to create their own data, then all of a sudden we will have orders of magnitude more data to train these models. And it's like a snowball effect at that point. We're gonna have incredible amounts of synthetic data, which will make the models that much better to reach AGI more quickly and then we'll be able to create even more better data and I believe that's a part of what QSTAR is they figured out a way to create really good high quality synthetic data and then use that data to self-improve using the AlphaGo techniques and I'll link to my previous video about QSTAR in the description below and here's an important line right here Today, synthetic data has taken on a much grander task, removing humans from the loop of making AI both aligned and enjoyable to use. Now that's important because right now, the bottleneck in creating AGI or even just creating better AI is the human in the loop because we have to either create the data or we have to give feedback to the models, both of which, if we're able to automate that, unlocks AGI's potential. And here he mentions OpenAI's new mysterious super alignment team tasked with using AI feedback to solve alignment. And in parentheses, because humans won't be powerful enough. And yeah, I mean, this is all science fiction to me. This is so cool to think about. It's also very scary because when you basically take your hands off the wheel, you're trusting that the AI is going to do the right thing. And that's what alignment is all about. And I'm not sure that I fully believe that it's ready for that, but technology is going to progress whether I believe it or not. As the current or next generation of models akin to Gemini and GPT-5 will have likely trained on 
all of the high quality data of the internet with the last sources coming from things like YouTube and podcasts, model providers are looking to new directions to get the last few orders of magnitude of data needed for scaling laws to hold. A core assumption behind proponents of synthetic data at scale is that simply adding more data will make the model better at solving long tail task evaluations. Now the argument against synthetic data follows that all the data we are generating is from the same distribution as the current best models. So some do not expect the soda to be advanced by it. State of the art. So basically, if we're using the same data for these cutting edge models, and then the cutting edge models are creating new data, the data that they're creating is only going to be as good as a derivative of the existing data. And I tend to believe that, but I don't really think that GPT-4 is coming up with new and novel ideas because everything it does is just a derivative or a prediction based on its existing data. And that's why QSTAR is so interesting. Now, if I were to argue against myself for a second, I would look at the AlphaGo example, where the AlphaGo team took data from all the human players, all the human games, of AlphaGo and train the model. And the model could only become as good as the best players in the world, but they couldn't surpass those players until they started using self play. And what they would do is they would set up two versions of AlphaGo, slightly different, play against each other. Whichever one did better, they would learn from that and continue to iterate. And of course, they did this millions of times. And then all of a sudden, AlphaGo became better than the best human players. So there's potential for self-learning here. And that's essentially what synthetic data is doing. It can create this synthetic data, test how well it performs, and then iterate again. But with the game Go, it's very clear what is better and what What's worse if you're winning you're doing better and if you're not you're doing worse but with language models it's not as clear how do you know whether you're doing better or worse and that's when you start to get these automated benchmarks but then you start dealing with issues of contamination and i'm going to make a video all about contamination because it is very very real and contamination basically means that you find the benchmark data in the training set. So these models are overfit for that benchmark, meaning they perform extremely well against the benchmark, but they're not actually that good. And that's why I really like testing all the models myself on my own test questions. Now, back to the article, I wanna talk about synthetic data one more time. Synthetic data is going to be especially powerful for companies that don't have their own unique data sets. X and X.AI with Elon Musk at the helm are really lucky because they do have this incredible self-generating data set with X and all the users posting things on X. OpenAI has to go out and buy data, but they have a ton of money. But what about open source projects that don't have that type of funding? How are they gonna get the data? And that's why synthetic data is so interesting, if it actually works. And here Nathan goes on to talk about synthetic instructions versus preferences versus critiques. And earlier this year, models like Alpaca and Vicuña used synthetic instruction data for the supervised fine tuning of Llama models to reach impressive performance. So basically they took the base model of Llama and then used ChatGPT to create these instruction data sets that helped fine tune the model to be extremely, extremely well performing. But I'm not sure if synthetic data is going to be able to build out a proprietary model. So I'm planning on doing an entire video about synthetic data and contamination in the LLM benchmarks because they are closely related. I feel like we're on the cusp of something incredible. It's a little bit scary as I've mentioned, but I'm mostly optimistic about the future of artificial intelligence. If you liked this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.